Hey, heads up, everybody. Up here, this guy's going to intro us. <laughs> Good morning, everyone, and welcome to B-Sides 2020 in Tampa. Today's presentation will be Offensive Python for Pen Testers, and the presenters for today's presentation will be Jeff, Joff, apologize, Thayer, and Mike Felch. With no further ado, Joff and Mike. All right, let's see, that was easy. You go first, Mike. Sweet. Okay, cool. So um, we're going to talk about just how to use Python um, in kind of an offensive mode. Uh, and so as we kind of step through this, um, my thing's not working. It's not working. No, no, no. We got to get this to work. All right, stand by, everybody. There, there it is. is. I don't know what happened. Okay, cool. So uh, I'm Mike Felch. I do uh, Vuln research, uh, exploit development stuff, um, reverse engineering, um, but I just do it um, more on the offensive side. And uh, so I kind of been with Black Hills for a while now, for a couple years, um, kind of in the red teaming and pen testing space uh, with Joff and a bunch of other uh, other people here. And uh, so I got my start in about 1999, 1998 area, um, kind of from this thing that was like the lost underground, like we don't even talk about it anymore. Nobody even knows about it anymore. Um, but it was kind of like real fringe kind of underground internet stuff before there were like YouTube, right? So like Frack and some of the e -Zines. So that's kind of where I came from. I don't really have much to talk about or about myself really. Okay, so this quick intro. So now it's my turn. I'm Joff. Um, I do security research and dev work and mostly malware dev work these days uh, for Black Hills. Um, also do the Security Weekly thing on Thursday nights. Anybody a fan? There we go. All right. Hey, let's hear it for B-Sides, by the way. You ready? B-Sides, yeah! <laughs> All right. So also I'm a certified SANS instructor for Sec 573, which is, uh, what do we call it? Automating Information Security with Python. It used to be called Python for Pen Testers. That was so much easier. All right. So we're going we're gonna to talk about Python stuff in an offensive sense. And I'm going to turn it over to Mike to start off the show. And uh, then in the middle, Mike's going to kick it back to me, and then I'll kick it back to Mike, and, and then hopefully we can get through all these slides because there's quite a number of them. So over to you, Mike. Yeah. And it's not working again. Okay, cool. So what we're going to be talking about is uh, we're going to start with attacking cloud, right? So we're going to look at it from the perspective of looking at cloud providers. Um, some of the big ones, mainly we're just going to be focusing on AWS. We're going to look at Google a little bit. Um, we'll look at Azure. And we'll move from kind of the, the cloud aspect into the malware side of it. Uh, we'll look at some of the evasion and injection techniques that Joff really focuses on um, and really equips us at Black Hills um, on a daily basis with. And then um, on the execution side of the malware. Um, and we're doing this from Python. This is kind of like an overlooked area for a lot of, uh, a lot of what we do. And then we're going to talk about some ways to weaponize it. We'll look at some of the libraries and how they could be leveraged in order to, um, to kind of do it within your engagements, right? So a lot of times we see a lot of frameworks that are out there. We see a lot of tools that are really built, but um, a lot of times Python's really, really good for when you're on an engagement and you don't really have a go-to tool or you need to get some sort of code execution um, kind of within an existing environment. Maybe you have like a shell somewhere, a web shell, and you're just you trying to get something going, but you can't really load a tool. Um, so we're trying to get away from relying on tools and kind of building our own tools on the fly um, as we need to. Um, and then we'll look at some of the tooling and frameworks out there, and then at the end, uh, we kind of, um, we've opened up a repo and just kind of provided a bunch of stuff. So with that, we'll talk about attacking cloud. So this thing is driving me crazy. There we go. So uh, a brief overview real quick. We're going to look at infrastructure and services. So a lot of times what we hear is, uh, well, we don't, ha we don't use cloud, right? We we're not a cloud provider. So we're on an engagement. We're talking to a customer. And a lot of times they're just saying, hey, we don't even use the cloud. We just, that's it. But the reality is, because they're using Office 365, for instance, they have Azure. And they don't even know that they have Azure, but they do. Um, and so that's kind of where we're going. Or they'll say, well, we just use like Google Gmail Enterprise for our company email. But they forget that they have Google Drive and all of these other services for the collaboration frameworks. So a lot of times when we're approaching these organizations, they're looking for an, an engagement. They're hiring us as a red team. And, and they're saying, hey, we want you to come compromise our environment, go after our data. Um, but the reality is a lot of times what we've been seeing is we don't even have to go internal to the internal network anymore. We can actually just compromise the cloud infrastructure without ever having to get shell and DA on the internal network. Um, and we just do that externally and then it's kind of game over. 
Um, and so we're kind of exposing new attack surfaces on a regular basis to the customers, so they're not even really familiar with what they have. Um, and so thinking about infrastructure as like AWS services, Azure, Azure resources, um, and then think of like the services aspect of it as like Office 365 and G Suite. And so with that, um, a lot of times too, um, the, the pen testers that are going into the engagements are overlooking cloud as well, right? It's like we go in and we're, we have a one track mind. We've been doing it the same way for 20 years. And so we're going to throw some maldoc at them. We're going to get, you know, a macro execution. We're going to drop a shell on there. We're going to pivot, you know, the internal network to DA. And then it's just going to be, you know, we'll find where we need to go to get the gems. Um, but the reality is a lot of pen testers are actually looking over it as well. I mean, I, me as, this is how I came across this was, um, on an engagement where I accidentally had, I had credentials, but I, I just said, well, I wonder about this Azure portal thing. And then it just opened up a whole new world for me. Um, and so that's kind of what we're doing. Um, and then the other thing that's really cool about this too is that, um, these cloud providers are actually exposing their service, their service infrastructure using web APIs and they provide SDKs. And so what we'll just kind of look at some of the SDKs, um, and how they are integrating um, into it, and then we have a bunch of really cool code, code samples. Uh, but I'm just going to kind of show you just a little bit of how easy it is. But before we get there, um, I wanted to talk really briefly about OAuth, um, like a standard auth flow. This is really in particular for Google and Microsoft Azure. So th the thing is, you're going to be creating an app, and the app is going to be considered the client here. Now, in order for that client to be able to communicate with Microsoft or with Google, it has to have authorization. So when you're creating this application in their, their cloud infrastructure, you have to get like an API key or a token key that they give you. So this is, the reason why I put a diagram up here is because it gets a little confusing whenever you're starting to go down this road. Um, so the user here is going to end up being um, the credentials that you've compromised. So you've you know, password sprayed, you were able to lend some credentials to this company's organization. And so we're gonna use that company's, um, that target that we found those credentials for, and we're just gonna create an application we're going to authorize it with Google or Microsoft. And now any requests that we make to the resource server at these organizations, at these cloud providers, we're just going to authorize the application on behalf of the user. You get where I'm going. So the idea here is we need to create a client. We need to authorize to be able to authorize, right? Because if they want to just stop that, that client from being able to validate those credentials or use the resources, they can nuke it there. Um, and then we need to access the token on behalf of the user and then we just we just authentic we just authenticate for them, and then it's kind of um, up in the air for what we can do um, from there, right? So, with AWS in particular, there's this there's a library called Boto three. Now, Boto three is the AWS SDK for Python. It's super powerful. Um, it gives you the ability to create service clients, kind of for every single resource. Now, Boto supports right now up to 219 AWS resources. Um, a lot of people are using them for DevOps or on the engineering side. Um, so we're just basically using that same library, but we're weaponizing it. And so the idea here is the service clients introduce a low-level um, AWS access. So AWS creates like a, um, it's an API that they expose, and then they built this client that kind of wraps the API calls for you. So you can just use it in your code. You don't have to worry about building like a, a web client or any of those things. Um, it also maps one-to-one -to, -one to the AWS services. So if you're wanting to interact with, um, you know, AWS EC2 or anything like any database, you have full access over that. Um, and then the other thing too is I think all the operations are supported mostly. I, I wanna say all, but I, I'm pretty sure most of them are, are uh, supported. So you could create resources if you have the, the authorization to create them. You have the ability to delete them. You have the ability to change them and get data, describe data. So you could say, if they're running all these virtual machines in EC2 and you wanted to get a full list of them all, and let's just say that the credentials that you had were able to do that, you can you could actually leverage it. Um, the other thing is really cool about it is you can enumerate absolutely pretty much everything, every resource that they have. So this is where you'll see it in the news a lot on the tech news and all these tools that come out for like S3 buckets. This is exactly what it's doing. Um, and so with AWS, it's a little bit different than the Google and, um, and the Microsoft side because you're, you're using access keys and secret access keys. So instead of having to go through that whole authentication flow, what you could do is you could obtain access keys and secret access keys in a number of different ways. There's, there's lots of different vulnerability classes that give you that ability. Some of them are like using a server-side request forgery. So if you could find a way to leverage um, an internal web lookup or a remote file include, or a local file include where you could read files off the local system, like with an like XML exploit or something, you could, you could actually read the, um, the keys sometimes from environment variables or from files that are kind of sitting within the application. 
Uh, another really big one. This is probably my go-to on every red team. Like if I get if I get creds, I'm looking for the GitHub repo. I'm looking for the GitLab repo. Subversion. I'm looking for some code repo because nine times out of ten, somebody checked in an access key or a secret access key. Even if they revoked the commit and tried to reverse it out, you go to the commit history, you can still see the credentials kind of checked in. And so, um, or they're just oh, they're hard coding them in apps. I mean, how many times have I like reverse engineered uh, Android application and found that developers like hard coded access keys and secret access keys? Or Mike, <laughs> or they leave them on the production web server <laughs> facing the internet. Yes. Um, and so, and, and because of that, there's a lot of times where these services are actually misconfigured where you don't even need access keys and secret access keys for the organization. You could just go create your own on your own AWS, but because when they created the S3 bucket or the EBS volume for storage, they, they made it the group pol or the policy that was attached to it wide open, which is the reason why you see all these big data breaches that are happening. This isn't just AWS and S3. This is really any, I mean, this is Microsoft blob storage. This is, um, I mean, there, there's just, there are a number of storage problems kind of across the board. And so um, just thinking about that for a second, you got S3, right? This is the file storage. You got EBS volumes. And so like they're mounting uh, EBS volume and having a full file system on there and, and you have all like the keys of the kingdom. So you could transfer EBS volumes from one customer to another customer. So you could have yours, you could export it to your account and you've just basically expelled their entire volume. Um, and then Amazon will be really nice and remount it in your environment for you as long as it's within the same region. And so... You have EC2, so you have your your compute. So all their servers that are running in there. Um, there's some there's some cool stuff that you can get um, from some of the metadata associated with that. You got queues. These are these are always overlooked for some reason. Um, Lambda. So if you wanted some um, code execution within um, their AWS instance, you could you can kind of do it that way. Um, but it kind of goes on and on. So just looking at a brief example here. This is just um, this is 23 lines of code without the spaces um, that I just slapped together really quick using Boto3 and if you look at line 11, um, I'm pulling in the S3, and then what I'm doing is I'm basically just enumerating all of the S3 buckets. I'm enumerating all of the files in the buckets, and then I'm saying, hey, does this file match whatever I passed into my query? So if I wanted to pass in like the word password, I could search all of their S3 buckets, all of their files in their S3 buckets for the, for the files that I care about. And all I had to do is have an access key and a secret access key, um, and it and in this case, it didn't even have to be within their environment. It could have been mine if their environment was misconfigured. Um, and so sometimes you have read-only, but sometimes you have read-write. If the group policy on that, um, on that bucket's messed up, you could write to it. So now imagine planting back doors and it, it being loaded. Um, there's just a number of things um, besides data that you could actually do um, kind of with it. And so the other really cool thing with AWS is there's this thing called Secret Manager. The secrets manager manages exactly what you would think, right? Passwords, SSH keys. Um, you could actually plant binary files in there. And th this is a, a very trivial, it's another enumeration. It's only 32 lines, but this just really demonstrates um, the ability to be able to, to enumerate the secrets manager, check to see if it's a string, and then if it's a string, just dump that key value pair out. Because that's all it really is, is a key value pair. Now, Amazon happens to rotate the encryption for you on a regular basis, but if your access key and secret access key that you found has access to it, then you're able to read those secrets kind of out of there and um, and be good, or binaries as well. So I had some ideas about planting binaries in there and then maybe reading it from the inside um, for like uh, just kind of planting. But um, So Google, Google's a little bit different. Um, you'll notice here, if anybody's a developer on the Google side, is I'm, I'm mentioning the OAuth 2 client. I think they're deprecating it, but I love this one. This is the one that um, Bo and I use this all the time um, in all of our talks, um, all of our engagements where we're uh, facing a Google customer. Uh, we do a lot of really cool stuff with Google um, using this client. And so you register the app with Google, and then it gives you this tokens.json file that you could save to your local, your local machine. And now, whenever I run the, my tools, what happens is it reads in that token, it checks the authorization, it does have authorization, and then it says, hey, I want you to authenticate. And what happens is it pops open the browser, and you just log into the user's account, and it granted the application permission to whatever the permission roles that they had. And I'll talk on, on the roles on the next screen. But, and then from there, you can search files in G Drive. You could, you could pilfer their email, look for a VPN, passwords in their email. Um, Google Groups, we found um, credentials in Google Groups accidentally. Um, you could add back doors to their account. And, um, and this covers pretty much all of the G Suite, right? So you have the Gmail, the G Drive, the calendar, the whole nine yards. So, that Python setup right there will kind of get you started with the SDK. There are some other SDKs for Google as they've been moving into all these services. Um, they've kind of split it from the compute versus like the, the G Suite. 
Um, so there's different libraries you could do there, um, but there's a lot of them. And so uh, the attack surface is huge there. Um, this is just like a full, full blown backdoor. Um, so it's 24 lines. It's really not that much code. Um, and I will release the slide deck. You don't even have to really worry about reading it. Um, but just to kind of show you, um, the only thing I really want to point out here is the scopes. So on this application, the scope of what this application is asking for requests on are the Google Calendar, the Google Email, um, the Drive files, the groups, and then if they are a Google admin, I want to have full access over the entire Google admin SDK on the back end, right? Because I want to be able to create users, reset passwords, do whatever I want to do. So if I fished um, you know, a Google customer or if I password sprayed a Google customer that was a Google admin, um, you have full king, you have, you have basically domain admin on the external on their Google side. Um, and so this is fairly straightforward. This just basically creates a full access application. And then my file here, the saved creds.json, is going to have the authorization tokens that I need going forward. So if they do reset the password, which is great, um, and you know they, they, they triage the account, they get us out of the account, we lost creds, right? We're done, right? Nope. Because we had the back door. If they didn't triage this right, and they didn't clear the app back door, which you could, by the way, you can name the application whatever you want. So if you wanted to call it the customer's name, you're gonna, they're just going to think it's their own app. They're not even going to think anything of it. So they usually leave these in the background. Um, and so there's some really cool stuff with there. This is just you know persisting in, in a Google account. Um, and so Azure is really cool too. So pip install Azure. It'll actually go through all of their other libraries and install their full package. Um, it's the same thing. Um, so if you did... It's easier to, to kind of do it through the AWS or the uh, Azure CLI. So you just install the CLI and you can run AZ, CLI, uh, AZ login or whatever and it'll pop open your browser and do the same thing, right? So if you ever logged into a Microsoft Online account, that's what it's doing. It's basically asking for you to log in and then it's granting the privileges in order to go whatever application that's being federated through um, the Azure AD that's there. And so it's the same exact thing. It pops open the web session, it grabs the authorization, it stores it. And then it just lets you do everything the same way. Um, now, Azure has a bunch of um, APIs. They're like graph APIs. And it's it's super mess. Like, I, I tried to understand it one day. Actually, all of their stuff. I have such a hard time really understanding anything uh, with the Microsoft because they progressively um, bring new functionality to the equation, but then they change the names and they change the versions and you get kind of get lost. They change the way they do authorization. And so, in this case... Um, um, basically just enumerating like resources and you could you could break um, it breaks services into the smaller libraries so if you don't want to install the full blown Azure package you could just install Azure blob um, to get access to the blobs or whatever you want um, but it's the same thing with AWS you have your Azure AD which is really different um, but you have storage you have your key vault which is the same thing as like the secrets manager in, in some respect um, you have virtual machines with virtual machines you can run PowerShell scripts remotely on the virtual machine and so you could kind of get code execution remotely through PowerShell. Um, the Azure AD is a, is a separate, um, really a big problem. Um, so a lot of times, because what they're doing is they're syncing their on-prem Active Directory with their Azure Cloud Active Directory. And when they do that, what's happening is you have all of their users, all of their groups, all of their memberships, all of their devices, and you have full-blown, and any user can do it. So that's kind of um, what we do. So this is what it looks like when you pop up. So I just did a, a Python Cloud Azure AD Pi it's just like a little Python script that, um, that enumerates stuff. And, um, but it prompts open. It says, in this case, I'm using it where it's uh, prompting a code. You log in. You put the code there. This code is no longer good. I, didn't, I was going to redact it, but I was like, screw it. Um, and so uh, you put the code in, and then it grants you that you've signed in, and it stores it, and now you're good to go. And so from there, um, this is just enumerating users, groups, devices, memberships, SPNs. You could do all of it. It's not doing that in this amount of code. This is just doing the users. But um, So think about that for a second. If you're password spraying and you get one account that you've successfully password sprayed on a company that's using Azure AD and you use that one credential, you could grab all of the groups, all of the memberships and everything. So now you know, well, I know their domain admins or these people. Um, here are all the users. Now I could do a full spray, a password spray or a password attack. Um, but it also gives you new attack surfaces, too, because um, one thing that I don't have up here is applications. So if you think about Azure AD, it's authorizing applications that are external to the network to use the credentials for single sign-on and the federated services or whatever it is that they're trying to approve for authorization. So a lot of times, those applications that are approved, you can pull those application lists and find completely new attack surfaces for in, in like um, internal applications or third-party services. And so uh, SPNs are a little bit different if you're familiar with um, on-prem Active Directory um, SPNs, but for the most part, that's it. Um, and this is going to be a little freebie. So this is um, not Python, but 
if you do successfully compromise a credential for somebody that's using like Office 365 or somebody that has Azure, all you have to do is pivot over here to um, to the portal.azure.com, log in as that user, and you can pretty much see everything in a nice user interface. The really cool part about this is they can disable your access on the interface, but the command line access they can't do unless they turn on conditional rules. So they think, well, I just I flip the switch in the portal so they don't have access, but you can still access it through CLI. So, and so that's kind of on the cloud side. I don't know what I just did. We lost it. Broke the cloud. There you go. So now we'll talk about writing malware here. You want? That's you. So now we'll let Joff take over on the map. All right, so Mike, what a great series of slides. And by the way, just so you're aware, um, we're, we're going to publish the deck, and we're also publishing um, a giant repo of proof of concept scripts um, that you guys can use. So um, don't don't try to like read every line of code or think you have to actually take pictures here. Um, you'll be fine. All right. Um, all right. Which button? All right. So. Uh, I might have to switch it. All right, so um, my, my quick agenda is going to be this, right? Um, writing some Python malware. Um, we can talk a little bit about uh, evasion, uh, evading uh, AMC. Um, you are probably well aware that uh, that can sometimes be an issue, especially with PowerShell scripts. Um, we're going to talk about some custom shellcode injection uh, techniques and then just briefly uh, mention creating an executable with Python. Um, and my favorite thing, of course, is the custom shellcode injection stuff. So first of all, power, PowerShell detection with, uh, with AMC is, um, well, suboptimal and can be irritating, right? I mean, I bet you anybody's pen testing, you've run into it, like you bring on, uh, you bring down a power view from somewhere, or you bring down uh, your power up tools, whatever, and you, uh, you know, use IEX in your PowerShell, and AMC goes, hey, you can't do that, stop. All right. So how do we get around that? Now, many of you are probably aware of Daniel Bohannon's work, right? He's got Invoke Obfuscation. It's awesome. I mean, it's an amazing piece of work. And you can certainly go that far if you want to obfuscate PowerShell. But honestly, AMC is actually not as sophisticated as you think. All right. In fact, you'd be surprised that a simple script which I've developed here called PowerStrip, like the name. I'm not good at marketing, but we call it PowerStrip, okay? Which um, all it did, the first iteration of the script, all it did was destroyed every comment in the PowerShell script. And it works for just about all the samples that I pulled down onto a desktop. Like no AMC, like really, not kidding, right? Um, there we go, right? So you know, just just the uh, the classic web cradle that I tend to use a lot is just a base sixty four encoded PowerShell script. Crank up a simple HTTP server in Python, not even encrypting, and then just use the uh, net system .net .web client and just to bring down that base sixty four, decode it, use IEX. We don't touch disk. We don't put anything on the disk. It's in memory. We're ready to execute. But AMC will still get you, right? This is standard. PowerShell, uh, PowerView, sorry. And when we brought that down, you can see down the bottom here, it says, nope, sorry, this script contains malicious content and has been blocked by your antivirus software. So, you know, you cry a little bit and then you go home and you, you stop pen testing, right? No, you don't really do that. All you do is strip the comments. And so this is Power, Power Strip at work. All it does is you give it a file name. It creates a file by the same name and it push, puts dash stripped on the end. And then you can base 64 encode it again if you want to. Although I was actually testing a customer the other day that didn't even need me to base 64 encode it. I was just pulling it over HTTP in plain text directly into the PowerShell. That was crazy. All right. And it worked, right? So here we have uh, me creating the cradle again, uh, downloading it, base 64 decoding it. And you can see I got the help on find domain share, which is part of the PowerSploit PowerView script. And uh, I'm off to the races, right? And all I did was took out the comments, right? But maybe, maybe you need a little bit more power. And if you need a little bit more power, 
I added one extra feature, which I think is kind of cute. I call it stutter. All right. Apologies to anybody who has a speech impediment. I call it stutter with a dash S. And what stutter does is it takes every applet in the script that it can detect and it just adds an extra letter to the beginning. So invoke becomes I invoke and get becomes G get. Right. Really simple concept. And so it analyzes it and puts it out. I mean, sorry, it processes it, puts it out to the file. We download it again. And this time, notice how it's for find domain share instead of just find domain share. And again, you're off to the races. So the combination of stuttering and just stripping comments has been sufficient for me to evade AMC every single time. And it's really not that sophisticated, right? Simple script. That one's in the repo for your enjoyment. Okay. Whoops. All right, let's talk about malware briefly. Now, Python natively has access to the C-types module on the Windows operating system, okay? And if you have access to the, the C-types module, you can actually set up kernel 32 calls into that DLL to do some interesting things in the memory of the machine, right? In fact, you can leverage it to run any shell code. So pick your uh, weapon of choice, whether it's MSF Venom, whether it's Cobalt Strike, or your own custom shell code if you're really feeling fancy, right? And generate out your raw shell code. And then usually what I do is just base64 encode it and slap it into the Python script that I'm about to use. Right? Now, as I mentioned here, there is a huge number of different process injection techniques. And this is not going to be a lesson on all those because we just don't have time. There's also a lot of really bad code examples floating around the internet, especially in the Python uh, case. In fact, Mike and I were searching for it, and we could not find a decent Python example. So I believe that this is the first series of process injection Python examples that exist uh, in any decent authored state. Anyway, try that again. Come on. All right, so shellcode injection. There's three fundamental steps to get your shellcode into memory, and it, do it varies a little bit depending on whether you're doing local process or remote process injection. But it comes down to this, allocate the memory, copy the shell code to the allocated memory, and create a running thread of code somehow, whether it's a remote process or a local process. We will not talk about reflexive DLL injection because that's kind of an ancient technique, and you just don't need to do it anymore, okay? We're not going to talk about um, process hollowing either. This is basically thread techniques that I'm going to present here in Python. Must be low in battery here. All right. First step, memory allocation. We have a limited number of kernel calls we can use for memory allocation. There's virtual alloc, which allows us to allocate memory in the same process. There's virtual alloc EX, which allows us to allocate memory in a remote process. And then the third one is kind of an interesting twist on that. And you can use the heap to create a new heap for yourself and then copy your shellcode onto the new heap within the same process. Now, I really wish there was a heap create EX. That would be awesome, right? But there isn't, unfortunately. When we come to copying the shell code, we pretty much have a couple of different choices. We can use RTL move mem for local in process. We can use write process memory for remote process injection. Okay. Now, one of the things I discovered when I was putting together these code samples from code that does not exist was that the C-types module in Python 3 is broken. Bummer. How is it broken? It does not allow you to copy shellcode into memory if the shellcode has null characters in it. Now, I know what you're all thinking. You're going, oh, I've got the encoders, right? I can just use the encoders. Well, yes and no. I suggest you don't use the encoders because there is a particular flag on the virtual alloc that you can use to make a segment of memory read execute only instead of read write execute, and it actually ducks under the wire a little bit. It's a little more... Uh, down low, perhaps is the way to say it, right? And so if you were to actually use the encoders, the problem with the encoders, like in Metasploit, for example, is that shellcode has to have the ability to write back to the same memory segment. And so we would have to leave that memory segment as read, write, execute. And I don't like doing that, so I don't encode my shellcode. Does that make sense? All right. That doesn't mean I can't do something like XOR the shellcode, though, right, in the script. I just don't encode it when I actually stick it into memory. 
For starting the thread, we have three basic possibilities. We can create thread in the local process only. We can create remote thread in the remote process. And then uh, per some interesting variants in the last couple of years, we can use asynchronous procedural call to actually queue up the code into a remote process. And if that code actually processes H asynchronous procedures, it can, it can actually fire off that thread of code, right? By processing the asynchronous procedure call. This last one is really, really cool. I'm not giving you a code segment on the last one. Sorry. I didn't have time. Okay. But I will give you some code segments on create thread and create remote thread. All right. One of the things I just want to tell a brief story. I know we haven't got much time, but Q user APC is so cool that something you can achieve. And this is a challenge for you guys to actually think about is you could actually find a process and Q user APC to every thread that process owns. And if it's shell code that gives you a C2 channel, guess what you end up with? Usually we will end up with multiple C2 channels. It's kind of cool because it'll fire it off in multiple threads. Now, one of the challenges with Python is you have to match up the argument types in the kernel 32 DLL because if you don't, Python C types makes the assumption that every argument going into the Q user, Q user, sorry, every argument going into the kernel 32 call is going to be MFC integer type. And that's suboptimal. We don't want it always to be an integer type. So we actually have to create some initialization code to actually set up the argument types for each kernel call based on the MSDN definition of that actual kernel function. So we go out to MSDN, we look for create thread. We find out that the arguments are going to be LP void, bool, maybe short, maybe D word, LP void again, right? And we set up our argument types and we can also set up the return type. So maybe it's a handle, maybe it's a void pointer again, maybe it's a bool, etc. All right. So we have to actually go through this step and this is tricky. If you don't get this right, your Python shellcode injection is not going to work. Trust me, I learned the hard way. Here's an example of injecting code into the same process. It really is this short once you have defined the argument types. So what we have on the screen is me using virtual alloc, using the mem commit and the page read write execute. Notice I made a comment on that earlier, right? I'm allocating memory in this case in the Python interpreter that's running this script. Then once I've allocated that memory, I'm using RTL move mem to actually move the memory uh, move, sorry, the shell code, whatever the shell code is, into that memory pointer. Then notice how I used virtual protect to reprotect the memory segment as read execute. And this is my way of ducking under the wire a little bit because read execute is less obvious than read write execute in terms of the kernel calls that your process is going to make. Okay. Now, this, where does this apply? Uh, anybody uh, running like a Sentinel-1 or a Silence? Right? This is the type of product that may be able to detect that you've got to read, write, execute. So we want to duck under the wire. We want to re-tag it as quickly as we can. Then we're going to use create thread in the same process. It will spin up that shellcode thread and you're off to the races. You've just simply created another thread in the Python process and your shellcode's executed. All right? If you don't believe me, I'm going to do a demo in just a minute. What about remote process injection? Well, the first thing about remote process injection is you have to find a process that you want to host your code in. Python has a module called psutil, which is actually fairly handy for looking for processes on a Windows system. So if we import psutil, we can write ourselves a little function that actually goes out and searches for interesting candidates to inject shellcode into. Well, one of my favorites is something that you guys all know about. It's our favorite process called servicehost.exe. Why? Because svchost.exe is something that always is initiating network connections. So if there's a C2 channel coming out of an svchost.exe process, your defenders are probably not going to be able to find it. They're like, which one is it? Right? They don't know. So we can create this little Python routine, and all this is doing is listing all the processes, and then it's going through this candidate list and looking to see if the current username owns the process and the process is named servicehost.exe, it adds it up to the candidate list and then I actually pick a random PID from the candidate list after I finish looping. Now that's an extra little bit of obfuscation because 
what I need to do there is not just pick the very first service host.exe because, well, that's going to be a little obvious. I should pick one at random, right? So I'm doing a little bit of a random choice here. <laughs> I keep doing that. I got to change the slide. For remote process in injection steps, I couldn't put the code on the screen, but this is one way to do it. We're going to use open process once we locate the process to grab the process handle. We're going to use virtual alloc EX to allocate the memory for the shell code. We're going to use write process memory to write that shell code into, into memory. And then again, we're going to come back with virtual protect EX to re-tag the memory back to read execute only. Okay. Then we're going to create the remote thread. And after that, frankly, we can free up the memory and close the handle. And that process will happily now host your shell code. And awesome, right? You're running. Now, let's, let me do a quick demo before I cover this slide. I want you to understand that this thing actually works. So here we have, have a innocent victim Windows box, i.e. the box that I pick on with myself all the time. Right? And we're going to run my little demo script called pyinjector.py. Now, my uh, de demo script uh, is something that is programmed in with three different techniques for shellcode injection. Technique number one is to use virtual alloc in the same Python process. Technique number two is to use heap alloc and then, sorry, heap create and then heap alloc to create the shellcode in a heap. And technique number three is to find a process that the user owns and use create remote thread to uh, stick the shellcode into that remote process. Now, I have a little bit of, uh, for some reason, it wants me to change my settings there. Okay, so let's try it now. You know how live demos go? Really well most of the time, right? No, the shell code that I've got here is actually shell code that injects a calculator command into, uh, into the um, cmd.exe and just pops a calculator, right? It's, it's MSS Venom, straight up. Windows slash exec cmd equals calc.exe. In the 64-bit case, it's Windows slash x64 slash exec cmd equals calc.exe. So this script is actually capable of doing architecture detection as well. And that's actually important because especially when you're finding remote process, you need the ability to find a process that matches the architecture of the shell code that you're going to run. All right. Now, who doesn't need a calculator? Ready? Option one, virtual alloc. Calculator. Woo. All right. Option two, heap alloc. Calculator. Woohoo! Hey, I'm winning on two out of three. Now let's see if the remote process injection will actually work. All right. Close my calculator. I really wanted to do the QUser APC version that injects into multiple threads, but I didn't have time. Option three, find a process that the user owns and use create remote thread. Calculator. Woohoo. All right. And the process it found, service host.exe, opened the process handle, allocated the memory, wrote 276 bytes of shellcode in there, and started a calculator. That code is available to you in the repo, all right? So you have some process injection code. And I think it's like the first example of process injection code that really exists. What did I do with the pointer? <laughs> now, the next thing you're going to ask me is, you know, customers don't have a Python interpreter happily sitting on their endpoint, right? I mean, what are you going to do? You're going to call up the customer and go, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm about to run a phishing campaign and... We've got a Python script here, and do you mind actually using a GPO to push uh, Python out around the environment? And the customer's going to go, no. Okay, so phishing campaign dead. What about uh, installing Linux subsystem? What about installing the Linux subsystem? That is a possibility, actually. Good thought. I didn't think about that. One option you have, five minutes, is PyInstaller. PyInstaller's not bad. PyInstaller goes out, it grabs the Python interpreter, it analyzes the script, it looks for all the dependencies that that script has, it wraps them all up into one self-extracting executable, and then you can drop that executable on the customer's environment and run it, presuming they don't have app whitelisting. Oh, bummer. What if they have app whitelisting? Well, you can get into the world of Iron Python. We don't have time to actually talk about that today, but ultimately, if you can deliver payloads that are DLL assemblies, you're always going to do better because then you can use tools like MS Build, Install Util, those kind of things to live off the land and load your DLL assembly directly in those tools. All right. 
I'm going to throw it back to Mike, and we're almost out of time. Go, Mike. All right, cool. So we'll just look at some libraries real quick. We only got a couple minutes left. So um, these are these are pretty cool libraries, and um, we use them on a regular basis. Um, some of them. Uh, the first one is Socket. It's the standard. Comes with Python. Um, you can build a C2 out of it. You could you know, do DNS stuff. Um, port scanning. There's an Nmap wrapper called Python Lib Nmap. Um, I like it, um, but you could also just do um, live port discovery by you know trying to make a Socket connection to the port on the host, and it'd be fine there. Um, if you're looking to do any packet manipulation stuff, so wanting to deal with actual packets, um, Scapy is great. You can construct packets. You could inspect packets. There's all kinds of stuff. Um, and then there's uh, PCAP interactions. So you've probably seen them in a lot of CTFs if you do the CTF. Like, they'll give you a PCAP file, and you're trying to figure out something to do with it. Um, so PCAPI is a good one. Uh, live host discovery is ping3. It's just a pinger. Um, it's kind of cool. Um, network protocols. In packets, like, the best of the best. I mean, you use it for everything from... I can't even get into it. There's every protocol, Samba. Um, and then for any exploit development, so if you're trying to run shellcode like on a remote thread or trying to do some sort of fuzzing on a remote system, Pwn Tools is really great for that. So on Windows, there's uh, the PyWin32. So if you're wanting to interact with the Win32 API, that's a great um, great library to be able to do that to. Uh, he mentioned C-types already for the DLL or any of the shared library stuff that you're trying to do. Um, if you're wanting to pivot um, on networks and one run code remotely, uh, there's a number of pivots. Um, you could do WMI, you could do WinRM, all the uh, PowerShell remoting stuff. There's good libraries that give you the ability to kind of integrate that into your shell script or into your Python script in order to kind of exe execute code on remote machines. Um, and so web and cloud, there's Shodan, obviously. There's a Shodan library that you can kind of integrate it right into your app. Um, web request, request is great. I'm going to skip most of this because um, attacking um, the new single page apps, right, the hipster frameworks that, like, Requestium is amazing, right? I mean, you get all these JavaScript apps, these single page apps that run JavaScript and generate sessions and you, it stinks because you use a request library but it's not triggering the JavaScript. Requestium actually wraps Selenium in requests. And so it gives you the ability to kind of do that and then interact with it, grab the session data and then transfer it to your request library to make like API calls or whatever you want to do. Um, cracking JSON web tokens, JWT is phenomenal. It gives you the ability to construct them. You can kind of brute force passwords. Um, from that direction. And then there's another, these are all just whatever. Um, but what I really wanted to show is um, there's a lot of frameworks that are already out there. So I'm not going to go through the exhaustive list, but there's a lot of Python frameworks that are already used that you're probably already using the tools for. You could build new plugins, you could extend it, you could fix bugs, you can make pull requests, you could do all kinds of cool stuff um, getting started with. That way you don't have to kind of do it all from scratch. But this is what we kind of put together for you too. Um, and this is um, live. I, I pushed it live at like 2 a.m. Um, but the Python pen testing uh, repo here, we put a bunch of um, scripts in there that kind of do stuff already. Um, everything from uh, metadata pulling from docs that Joff put together to his PowerStrip program to the PyInject one that he demoed. Um, there's a, a WinRM that's running uh, remote code on a machine using WinRM. Uh, there's the AWS, the one that I showed for the S3 buckets, and the secrets are up there. Um, the cracking, there's a crack JWT that shows you how to crack uh, JWT tokens. Um, and then just a whole bunch of other cool stuff. We kind of made it all available. We just threw it out there under MIT so you can kind of do it whatever you want. You want to integrate it into a product and create a startup and go to Silicon Valley and talk to angel investors and make a lot of money. Just do it. It's cool. Um, but that's it. That's uh, pretty much it. So that's our information there. If you want to find us on Twitter, um, I'm at you stay ready and then Joff's uh, Joff at underscore Thayer. Um, there's our site, and then there's the Python goodies. So I think we're out of time for questions, but if you want to have any questions, just read us out there, and we'll be good. Thanks, everybody.